tonight, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Dave Weatherman, uh, a local legend and someone I'm proud and happy to call a friend. Uh, Dave Weatherman began collecting insects as a child and birding in junior high. Now retired, Dave served as the forest entomologist for the Colorado State Forest Service from 1974 to 2005. Dave is well versed on many subjects, including, but not limited to, the eating habits of Colorado birds, odes being dragon and damselflies, how fox squirrels are clever and cute, spiders are creators and artists of silk, and now how a local cemetery can be a quality of life saver during a pandemic. Dave's favorite bird is the Blackburnian warbler, but right up there also are crossbills, shrikes, canyon wren, vireos, pelagic species, and the merlin. Dave has three sons, four grandchildren. He enjoys nature photography, and he thinks microbrews combine nicely with jazz. So, um, Dave, I'm going to invite you now to share your screen. And um, uh, you have the floor. Again, as Dave is doing that, I would remind people throughout his presentation, we're going to have you muted. If you would like to ask a question, you can type it into the chat window. I will let you know that most of the questions I'm going to hold until after his prepared remarks. Um, but if it seems appropriate to interrupt him, to ask one of your questions, I will do so. Um, so Dave, we can see your screen and you have the floor. Why don't you say a few words so I know your microphone's working and then I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you for the introduction, John. Can you hear that okay? Yes, you might wanna get a little closer to the microphone if you can, um, but yes, we can hear you fine. And I'm gonna hand it off to you now. Okay, good evening. I'm glad to be back uh, with the audience. I know. Hello? Um, I'm glad to be back here in front of the audience. And uh, this is, uh, I'm not a, an experienced Zoomer, so bear with me. But um, I think the last program that we had with Fort Collins Audubon was. My friend Janiel Thompson and I did a spider talk, and I was kind of hoping that the next time I spoke to Fort Collins Audubon, we would be back in person again, but that's not the case. And um, the pandemic is uh, pretty tenacious, but um, it kind of reminds me of one of my favorite stories about birders, and that is the the uh, legend of early Colorado birding, Thompson Marsh, when they ask him what his criteria were for accepting a bird on his list, he said he had to either see it well, hear it well, or sense its presence. Um, I sense your presence. So I guess we're, we're together, uh, even though I can't hear you laugh or I can't see you yawning or anything and that's kind of disconcerting as a speaker but um let's get on with this talk uh, uh everybody knows that uh grandview cemetery is my patch and i get a lot of uh teasing about going there and going there and going there but i think uh the joke is on everybody else because i I learn a lot when I go there and it's a great place. And I think in my mind, it's an example of what we can all do in our patch and what we can all learn when we go to a, a, a neat place that has a few natural attributes and just see it in all seasons and all moods and look up and look out and uh, know it well enough to know where to look and what's a difference from yesterday. And uh, that's the way 
uh, I consider going to the cemetery, going to school. And uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, 2020 was um, an experience for all of us. And uh, this cemetery to me is uh, more than a cemetery. Uh, so starting out with the, the basics of this place that's on the west side of Fort Collins that was established in the late 1800s. Uh, to me, it was interesting in reading about the history that the first grave digger in Sexton was a guy named Joe Woodcock. So uh, this place has always had an association with birds. It's, it's 45 acres and uh, there are roughly 34,000 burial spaces there of which 27,000 have been filled. The current rate of burial is about 250 a year. So it's going to take a while to fill it up, but uh, at some point it will be full and we have another cemetery on the east side of town. About 700 trees, which uh, makes it a, a nice urban forest. It has a very challenged understory. Uh, the rocks are square and they mow the grass and pick up every little twig, but um, it's still a, a, a great place for nature, uh, kind of an ecotone between the mountains, the foothills, and shortgrass prairie, which this place used to be shortgrass prairie. Uh, prior to 2020, I figured out the other day that I had been there 1921 times. So all you people that keep telling me to get a life, uh, uh, I'm going to keep going back. Um, we started hearing about COVID-19, I think in September when the Chinese first started reporting it. Uh, the shutdown hit us along the front range of Colorado in March. And so far this year, we've had about 20,700 cases in Larimer County. Uh, we've had 224 deaths that are attributed to COVID. Like I was saying before, for the, the number of burials last year was around 250, and only 11 of those are listed as COVID-19, although um, Kevin, the manager of the cemetery, tells me that the number is probably higher if we knew, knew everything, but only 11 are reported as COVID-19. And if you look at the cemetery, you see a lot of burials in, in 1918, which was the Spanish flu, and about 5% of the Fort Collins population of 7,000 people died during that Spanish flu epidemic and ended up at Grandview. So if we took 5% of our current population of 168,000, we'd have almost 8,400 people would have died of COVID. So um, you can see the comparison. It's it it's, hasn't been as bad as the Spanish flu around here anyway, but it certainly has had a toll on the United States. Um, early on when the first regulations were coming out about public health, uh, I made some executive decisions and I decided that the 27,000 souls at, at the cemetery were safe to be around. They were not contagious and they were six feet distant under. And um, I decided that the 3.1 miles from my apartment to the cemetery was local and that it was essential that I go there for my health and mental and physical and to keep the string of uh, monitoring visits going. So I will admit to you that I went there 175 times last year, 175 days, and sometimes I went more than once on a day, but um, typical visit was about two hours, but I was there as many as six and seven hours on some days, and usually about two, uh, two miles of walking. Uh, early on in the shutdown, I was there 71 out of 73 days between the shutdown and early May. Um, 
and but I don't consider that I was going crazy. I was going to school, and instead of going a half day to one day a week, I beefed that up to three and a half days a week, and uh, just got deeper in a place that I already knew pretty well. So the year started out on January second. Uh, birders always talk about good birds, and I know they're all good, but. There were four birds that I saw that day that that were exciting in terms of not birds you see all the time, and that was uh, spotted towhee, a northern goshawk, a yellow-bellied sapsucker, and I did have a pair of red crossbills fly over that first day. So I thought 2020 is starting out great. Um, I watched this little red breast or white-breasted nuthatch uh, cleaning out a hole. Uh, early in January, and I thought he was pretty brave because the tree that he was sharing was also the tree that is uh, occasionally visited by the little red faced screech owl, for which Grandview Cemetery is uh, fairly famous among birders. And uh, apparently, he wasn't worried about living next to a screech owl. Um, I went to Lamar for a couple weeks in January, so I didn't have too many visits in at, at Grandview in, in January. February started out cold and, and one thing I've always enjoyed are the ice patterns in the puddles on the road, which you see here. I uh, see some amazing patterns that were made by frozen water. Um, looking back, the first creatures that were wearing masks at the cemetery were cedar wax wings. And they're, they're always uh, with the program as far as COVID-19. Uh, that looks like tar, but it's really melting snow. Uh, one thing I enjoy about going to the cemetery in the winter is studying the architecture of the trees without leaves. You can actually see the branches and the patterns. You can see the squirrel nests up in the trees, uh, bird nest, and there's a good reason why American elm was favored as a shade tree in the Midwest and a, a large portion of North America because of its magnificent kind of vase shape with uh, multiple stems that kind of branch out from the bottom. And uh, this is a, a magnificent American elm at the cemetery. We've fought Dutch elm disease very hard in Colorado, the agency I worked for in the cities, uh, Fort, Fort Collins was, has been very aggressive about Dutch elm disease. And we're lucky we still have many, many American elms in this town. And uh, this is a great example of why they're worth fighting for. Um, the tree resource at Grandview is, is fairly diverse, but, but there's five species that if we looked at those, 70% of the trees would be those five species. And uh, over half of the trees there are just blue spruce and American elm. So those two trees are very important to birds um, as nesting places, as sources of food. And um, uh, if you go to Grandview, those are the trees where those five species are where you're going to see most of the birds. Um, one of the more interesting blue spruce that I found during 2020 that I hadn't seen before was uh, I was fairly far away and I was looking for the great horned owl you know, to scan in the spruce in an area where I thought they might be. And a little bit of motion caught my eye and I could tell it was insects. And this was in February or in March. And I went over and checked and here, here was a major stem of a spruce that had broken off at the top, uh, was obviously decayed probably starting from that broken top down inside and, or maybe that was the reason the top broke, but I could see multiple cavities from probably flickers and going in and out of that cavity. Um, um, the one tree that I saw was, was, uh, were bees, honeybees. This particular tree I noticed um, down at the, the, bottom red arrow is pointing to kind of a yellowish structure which I showed in the the other frame and that is the fruiting body or the spore producing 
structure for this particular decay fungus called Fomis pinicula. And uh, Fomis pinicula is, uh, decays the heart uh, of uh, trunks, the heartwood. And this picture down in the lower right shows a close up of that surface, the undersurface of that uh, fruiting body or conch is a, another name for it, C-O-N-K. And those little tubes, those little uh, pores produce the spores. So I was watching, I heard some pecking one day and sure enough, there was a red breasted nuthatch which was excavating this fruiting body of the fungus or this conch. And loggers know that when you see those conchs that there is decay uh, for several feet above and below where that structure appears on the outside of the trunk. It looks sort of like a horse hoof or a shelf. And uh, this little nuthatch knew if I can get through this thing, I know there's going to be rotten wood under there, a big cavity, an easy place for me to have a home. It worked on it for days and it never finished it for some reason. I thought, sure, this was going to be a cool front door that this red breasted nuthatch had. And uh, it got pretty far in and never finished it. So there's still a hole in that conch, but it never was extended into the middle of the tree. But that was a cool thing that I had never seen before. Uh, we have a pair of red-tailed hawks that nest in the southeast corner of the cemetery in a spruce. They really work the ditch that runs through the cemetery. In the winter, that ditch is dry. And it's amazing the number of voles, uh, microtus, those short-tailed uh, mice or rodents that these red tail hawks get. And this uh, male red tail is bringing a nice morsel to its mate that's on the nest. Uh, we had some good snow in March, like we're going to get this weekend. And a lot of the birds, especially the berry fruit eaters like robins and solitaires and flickers and starlings and waxwings all went to junipers and then this particular tree that we have commonly uh, escaped along the front range called common buckthorn ramnus cathartica and here's a robin eating the fruits of buckthorn in a in the middle of the snow and it was doing fine uh, I want to talk a little bit about this. This was one of the major discoveries in my mind this past year was how important this insect called the European elm scale is to birds. And I think maybe 2020 was, it was exceptionally important to birds because of some late freezes we had in the spring that killed a lot of the early insects. And this scale, which is an immobile uh, insect for most of its life cycle, was available. It was available in good numbers. And so a lot of birds resorted to scraping these things off the, the uh, branches of, of elm trees. And this is an introduced insect, like a lot of our uh, pest insects are. Um, it has a sucking mouth part, it plugs into the tree and withdraws the plant fluids. It secretes uh, waste is uh, referred to as honeydew because it's sticky and sugary. Um, infested trees, chronically infested trees are really easy to see because they develop a kind of a blackish appearance on the tops of the limbs and where the trunk flares out at the bottom. Anywhere that sugary excrement, that honeydew falls and accumulates, then this blackish fungus called city mold grows on that. It's available to birds all year round, and I, it was really important last year. So here are our four pictures of the, the different life stages, and um, don't expect anybody to memorize all this, but the, the nymphs that we see through the winter are kind of whitish. Uh, little turtle shells that are accumulated all over the, the branch. Um, in the spring, some of those develop into males, which I had never seen the males before, but that, that little insect there at the top with the fork, two long streamers, uh, 
the caudal um, structures. That's a male. I'd never seen them before. They're very small, like two millimeters. And uh, females, some of them just uh, develop. And then the lower right is the way it looks all summer. Uh, they produce eggs, which hatch into these little things called crawlers. Uh, they're mobile. They move out and feed on the, the leaf veins for a while. Then they move to the branch, and we've kind of gone full cycle. But birds were, were getting the nymphs, particularly, and then uh, somewhat the lower right, the adult females. But here's the appearance of a chronically infested tree. You can see that blackish uh, upper surface to the limbs and trunk. And birds, I'm sure, recognize that from a distance and know where that uh, blackish appearance is. There's a chronic infestation or the, there's available scales to feed on. So here are chickadees going after the European elm scale. Here are, here's the cedar waxwing that's feeding on them. And this, this went on for hours. And it, there's a limitless supply of these things. So uh, the birds had kind of a fallback food. Uh, peanut butter and jelly was always available, whether their favorite things were available or not. Here's a red-breasted nuthatch and getting them. It's a downy woodpecker, and then we had a fairly good uh, invasion of the city by Casson's finches last spring, and they were also eating these urban insects that I don't think that they probably had any experience with, and I don't know if they watched the other birds and then kind of tried it out and it seemed to be okay, and so then it was on their menu too, but I, I can't believe Casson's finches. Um, it's very well known that they would feed on European elm scales, an urban insect and a, and a mountain bird. Uh, here's a bush tit on the left, which when I first moved to Fort Collins in the 70s, we didn't see bush tits up here. Anything, any bush tit north of Colorado Springs made it onto the hotline. Well, now with this climate change and southern things moving north, bush tit is now part of the scene here. They breed in town, they breed all the way to southern Wyoming, and the southwestern bird is part of our scene now. And they are eating the, the scales. On the right is a ruby crown kinglet doing the same thing. There's a bush tit with some nymphs uh, clustered on its beak. Um, they're sticky and uh, you see a lot of, the birds do a lot of maintenance, uh, bill wiping and cleaning up after they've done this feeding on these uh, sticky insects. So the first spider of the year was this little wolf spider that uh, I saw out and about on the 24th of March and starting to get warm, even though we had the good that one good late snowstorm. Uh, the ice was melting over at City Park, and I, I went over to Sheldon Lake quite a bit and kind of expanded my definition of the cemetery to include all of City Park uh, a lot of days. And uh, when the ice melts, of course, there's a lot of fish available because of the oxygen starvation underneath the ice. And when the ice melts, there's all these dead fish and the gulls and some of the fish eating waterfowl really uh, score. And this is a pretty large green sunfish that this ring billed gull had right there by the, the boat dock. So I got ahead of myself there a little bit ago with this uh, hole in a spruce tree, but this is uh, a, a different tree. And I, this is where I noticed the motion, and it turned out to be. Uh, bees going in and out of a hollow in, in, in the broken trunk. And I looked around and there were uh, a lot of flowers in the cemetery in March, but they're mostly plastic. And I couldn't figure out what these bees could be foraging on until I looked and there was, these two flowers were out and it looked to me like the pollen that they had collected on their baskets um, was 
bright yellow, probably from these two flowers, and maybe they had some other tricks, but the ones, the flowers that were close to the, the, the nest, the bee tree were, were these two, crocus and benelon. So my father used to always say he, he watched his neighbors go to war with dandelions and then on his deathbed, he told me, I wanna grow a whole yard of dandelions and just tick off the neighbors. And um, he was right that dandelions have got a, a place in the grand scheme. Uh, and then we started seeing things like this show up and then you could tell we were into a different kind of a year, but somebody went around scattering these little uh, pieces of paper that had this is truth number nine if you see up in the upper right and uh, this truth number nine said that this medical institute in Guangdong, China recommended taking chloroquine and uh, we, you remember back in the early days of COVID we had all these debates online about what, what was good to take and what wasn't good to take and I think when I saw this we had just decided chloroquine wasn't very good to take or wasn't all that helpful but um, I don't know, it just struck me as strange that we we're starting to see things like this on the ground, just scattered around, like we need more sources of information than we already have. Um, April was a very special month during last year for me and my visits. I mean, it was amazing what, what I saw. I went there every day in April and it seemed like the whole world was starting to go outside. Everybody was getting pent up, uh, fed up, spring fever, cooped up with COVID, and they, everybody had a dog, and and everybody was out walking. And I saw tons of more people in the cemetery at City Park than I'd ever seen before. And uh, instead of five dog people going by the no dog sign on a typical day, now in COVID there was. 40 or 50 people going by the no dog sign with their dogs. And uh, they're mostly on leashes and they're multi behaved. And I it didn't bother me that, that they were doing that. But uh, no contrails in the sky from the jets. Uh, uh, could hear stuff better because the traffic wasn't near as uh, bad. We started seeing masks. We started seeing masks showing up on headstone photographs. And this uh, teenage girl, um, she she gets a very decorated grave every month, every holiday. But uh, she's the first one I saw with a mask on her picture. Uh, we had a, a big freeze in early April. And this is a Himalayan white pine, which is certainly not a native tree to Colorado. But there's some special trees planted out on City Park 9 golf course. And this Himalayan white pine, which you would think a Himalayan tree would be pretty adapted to cold weather, but it, it really didn't like that freeze and all the needles bent in this very uncharacteristic fashion. And looking at that tree last month or about a month ago, it looks like this. It's not going to die, but it's still showing the effects of last April's freeze. It put on some new growth at the tips of the branches. You see green and the, all the brown stuff is 2020 foliage or earlier. But uh, uh, so the trees suffered, the insects suffered from these late freezes that we had last year, which were a little bit abnormal. Um, one of the major events of, of last year was the first nesting of red crossbill. The, the nesting of white wing crossbill was kind of famous back in 2009, 2010, but I had never known red crossbills to nest in the cemetery. They visit fairly often, but uh, on January 2nd, I saw those two. Then I went up uh, to the cemetery with Norm Lewis from Denver and we saw a male singing away that was kind of suspicious. He was singing a song. He wasn't just doing the flight calls. And then on the 27th of February, I, I saw an amazing thing, which we'll talk about here. So here I was walking through the cemetery and I see a reddish bird up in a maple tree near an old robin nest. And I assume it's a house bench. 
and I look and it's a Red Cross bill male pulling stuff out of the cup of the robin nest and it was pulling out the, the liner, the soft stuff, the tissue, the fine grass, uh, some of this like almost looked like plastic, but it was definitely recycling this old robin nest. The female was doing the same thing and she was uh, what she had almost looked like dryer lint that I think the robin had used. They weren't using the mud and the, uh, the framing of the nest, they were using the cup material. And they were flying up to a spruce tree right nearby. And I was sure, even though I had suspected this, I was sure now that they were indeed nesting. It's a, the male with a little bit more material. And after they did this for a couple hours, they came down to a puddle right in front of my feet, like literally three feet away, and took a big drink out of the puddle. And it almost looked like they were celebrating the finishing of their nest. I didn't see them for three days after that. And it was just like, well, we did it. And uh, let's have a drink. And, and I'll go grow some eggs over here in the quiet for a while and then come back and lay them. Um, this is the nest, pretty easy to see, right? Right there. It was about as big as a bowling ball. And what I think it was mostly made of were little interior twigs that the crossbills had broken off the very inside of the crown. I mean, I would see them go into the tree right along the trunk and they break off these little stubs of branches, little short pieces. And I think that whole nest was pretty much made out of these uh, little short, maybe a half inch thick uh, pipe cleaner uh, dimensions uh, uh, width and then, sh but shorter. And, and that whole nest was made out of that, but it was very hard to see what was going on. They super secretive coming and going and the male would visit the nest and there'd be a little bit of chirping beforehand to make sure you in there but you know is my lady in there yes i'm in here and he'd zip in there and feed her and then zip off but uh, here's the female and she was left over right her upper mandible went to the left and um uh, she was fairly drab, kind of an olive green, lime green color. And uh, the male would go to the tops of the spruce. And I think he was feeding himself on these spruce seeds that he used his cross beak to extract from those cones. And then he would bomb off to the west, clear out of the cemetery. And I think she had requested ponderosa pine seed mash and he had to go get it and i'm like why did you guys nest in the cemetery <laughs> two miles from ponderosa pine if that's what she wanted but what mama wants mama gets mama ain't happy nobody's happy so he went and got it for her and i think that's what was going on um uh, and i thought i had to timing of this nest and the production of young all calculated it out. And one day I was in there and David Wade uh, had shown up and uh, we heard some noise coming out of this little Christmas tree sized spruce near the nest tree. And I was looking in there and there was the female and she was very tame and let me get right in there and photograph her, but she acted like there was something she wanted to do, but she didn't want to do it while I was there, but she didn't fly away either. And I kind of backed off and was talking to Dave and this couple came in and we were showing them the, the female. And then I saw her go over and feed a baby. <laughs> and the baby had fledged, one baby, a fledgling was, sit, was right there where I was and probably a foot from where I was, I didn't even see it. And that's it in the middle of the screen there, uh, pretty hidden. And when they don't move, uh, that stripey coloration uh, hides them pretty good. 
and this is the young crossbill that doesn't have a crossbill yet. And um, I, well, I was amazed to, to find this. I mean, it was thrilling to be close to this baby and watch. And uh, it went to sleep. And while it was asleep, it would quiver its bill. And I remember from reading up on the white wing crossbills, when you see that, what they're doing is in their sleep, they're bringing up food from their crop and actually um, feeding and breaking down the food a little better before they swallow it while they're sleeping. And I think that's what this baby was doing with its beak. It was just quivering like it was uh, nervous. Or, um, but it, it was a very uh, cool experience. And then the mom did come in and feed it a couple times while I was pretty close and I tried not to move and be scary at all. And uh, I was rewarded with this awesome experience. Um, a day later, I was in there and I heard the call of the, the young, which is very similar to the flight call of adult red cross bills, but a little bit different. And I found them in an elm tree and was amazed to watch the female who was right next to the young one turn around, scrape off some of those European elm scales, and then whirl back around and feed it to this youngster. So there's yet another species of bird that was feeding on those European elm scales. Um, but this day, the 12th of April, the weather report said it's supposed to snow tonight. It's supposed to snow tomorrow, and it did. And I was worried about this youngster. Is this youngster going to be all right? And uh, um, I went back and um, actually saw the, the youngster with the female in a different part of the cemetery. And then I saw the female start chirping and then take off. And there was two babies following her, and they flew out of the cemetery. Two fledglings uh, followed her out of the cemetery off to the west, and that was the last I ever saw them. And I think she was taking them up to the mountains where the real food is that uh, her husband had to bring her. And um, I did see some crossbills in the cemetery a, a little bit later, a week later. And I'm not sure if that was the same adult pair nesting a second time or if this was a different pair. And I never did find the nest of that second uh, pair of crossbills, but there was some activity the next week. And we know that crossbills do uh, raise two broods a year. Uh, so here was April 16th, which maybe we, that's a picture we could fast forward to Saturday or Sunday this week, but uh, you can see a lot of breakage. That's a road right there in the, to the left of the stop sign is a road with a big American elm branch across it. And this is very typical of what uh, the, the tree resource in that cemetery is wonderful, but it's not without uh, need of care. And there's a lot of maintenance goes on that keeps those trees nice and, and healthy. And uh, cleaning up storm breakage is a big job for the cemetery folks. Uh, during that storm, I saw some cool stuff over. This is that Club Tico that's over by the swimming pool at City Park. And uh, the bluebirds were migrating. And here's two mountain bluebirds getting out of the storm on the leeward side of the building, hanging out in the vines and the windowsills, just waiting for it to clear. And these mountain bluebirds that migrate early in spring are used to having to cope with uh, spring snowstorms and, and they do pretty well. But I think in this case, they were using uh, human and there's probably a little heat coming through that wall too. And here's a Western bluebird on the boardwalk there at City Park by the lake. I don't see them too often down in town. Um, but this one day with uh, Pied-billed grebe diving underneath the uh, the uh, boardwalk and the mountain bluebird sitting on the boardwalk and white-faced ibis at City Park Lake 
Uh, this is not a typical day at the city parks cemetery where, or a city park lake where it's usually mallards and Canada geese and farm ducks and dogs. Um, this was real birding around city park lake. Uh, the first venture birding thing, the first chase, the first going after a bird other than at the cemetery that I did in 2020 after the shutdown was uh, this Louisiana water thrush that two students, uh, ornithology students at Princeton at CSU uh, found. And I think probably a lot of us skeptics thought, oh, it's got to be a northern water thrush. It was not a, a northern water thrush. It was a Louisiana water thrush. It was within walking distance of my apartment. So I said, I can do that and uh, be safe. And I went over there and there it was in that little uh, spring park by the fire station there east of uh, College Avenue. Pretty amazing bird. So that was my one venture away from the cemetery to see a bird. Uh, while I was over there, I was treated to seeing uh, the flowers of European larch. So that was just kind of a bonus. Uh, back at the cemetery, uh, I got to, to watch the courtship of cedar waxwings. And part of that involves, with a lot of birds, it involves the male exchanging food with, with his prospective partner. And here's two cedar waxwings passing this juniper cone, which uh, my botany friend Dave Steingraber tells me those are cones, not berries, technically, but botanically, that's that's a cone. We call them berries. But they pass this thing back and forth uh, 10, 20 times uh, until the female finally accepted it and ate it. But it was cool to watch this courtship of cedar waxwings. Um, so one morning when I was doing my uh, walkabout of the Sheldon Lake before I went to the cemetery, I saw this bird. And so this is a quiz. What is that bird? It's small. It's all gray from this view. It has yellow legs and feet. And that's a warbler. I can hear people screaming, Northern Pagula. Northern Perula, yes, you're right. It's a male, and it was one of the, I guess, rarest birds I saw last year in the city park area. It was great fun. He was singing his brains out in one of those willows along the boardwalk. The great blue heron was over there. Uh, they stocked that lake for fisher people, and the cormorants thank them, the great blue heron thanks them. And I wonder how much of that stocking gets eaten by people, probably not very many. And I don't know if I'd eat it anyway out of that lake, but um, there's a wood duck pair there that I think is probably a, an annual thing in the spring that they show up there and then they disperse into the neighborhood the nest in the cavity of a cottonwood, probably. And these, this pair always flew off to the north. I saw them for a couple of weeks in April and early. I think I saw them in May. But that's got to be the prettiest duck in the world. Um, it was a thrill to see evening growth speaks in the cemetery. I don't. I've been going there for 47 years and I've only seen them in the cemetery landed a few times. I've heard them flying over several times, but uh, they were in there eating the flowers of these uh, Norway maples and they were also eating, guess what, European elm scales. Um, I ran into Lori and Fawn and Simon's uh, at Sheldon Lake one day and Fawn goes, oh, look. A uh, Lewis's woodpecker. That's not your normal city park bird. And sure enough, there was a 
beautiful Lewis's woodpecker working the uh, cottonwoods there on the northwest side of this Chum Lake. Very unusual. Um, I love the way they do the flower boxes at the cemetery and definitely adds a lot of color to that um, entry bridge area. Okay, so uh, here's a blue jay. Looks like messing with Sasquatch to me. Uh, the, the, the hawk could never, <laughs> never figure out where he was coming from and would scream. And the jay was always one step ahead of him, one 90 degrees behind where he was looking and just totally harassed this uh, red tailed hawk. And the red tailed hawk was sitting on the top of his nest tree. And um, I'm thinking this is one scoundrel uh, messing with another one. But uh, the Jay was amazing how he would come in, do a straight down dive. And, um, but all these species, uh, these wonderful species that we would all love to see in our yard at our feeders. Uh, orioles and tanagers and buntings and grosbeaks, they were there last spring, I think, in greater numbers and longer lasting before they dispersed to the river or to the mountains than usual. And so for these people that pay their dues and clean their feeders and, and add oranges and talk to their spouse into spending money on expensive feed last spring was worth it and in early may they got a lot of action and good really colorful birds that were as good as costa rica but i started walking in the, the neighborhood to the east of the cemetery between Grandview Avenue and Fry Avenue bordered by a mountain and Laporte Avenue on the other side. And uh, a lot of people feed birds in there. A lot of people who get it as far as nature, a lot of people who tolerate me walking around and I've really grown fond of that neighborhood and the people who live there. Um, here's a Plumbius vireo, which is another bird that I don't normally see maybe one a year at the cemetery and it was over by Sheldon Lake in the trees and it has a prey item in its feet. And this is a prey item that I commonly see if, if I can ever identify something that a large vireo has, one of the solitary vireos, blue-headed uh, cassins or plumbius, it's always this. And it's called a rough stink bug, and they're um, common on tree in trees. They're very camoed on bark, and somehow these vireos find them. And every time that I I can actually discern what a one of these big vireos has, it seems like it's always this brachymena, this rough stink bug, and. Uh, they're, they're predaceous uh, mostly. They probably do some sap feeding, but I think Whitney's probably out there or Boris, they could correct me, but I think I think this one is somewhat predaceous. Um, Rose-breasted grosbeak is a bird we all love to see, an Eastern bird, and we see some at feeders along the front range in spring. And it seemed like I saw a few more of these this year or in 2020 than normal. And they were over by the ball fields at City Park in left field. There were some green ash trees actually growing out on the golf course. And it, there was a rose-breasted ghost beak there for almost a week. And it was feeding on the elm scales and the elms and um, these insects in the ash, it's called an ash plant bug. And they were very heavy. You can see what the plant bugs are doing to the leaflets. Uh, ash has a compound leaf. So maybe five leaflets make up one leaf. And so these three green things here are parts of one leaf, three fifths of one leaf. 
the ash plant bug was being fed on by that uh, rose breast and gross beak, and that's a combination I'm not sure I've ever uh, written down before. Um, one thing that I found amazing as being a favorite food last spring was green ash flowers that had been frozen and killed. And I don't know if these, I mean, they're rich in, flowers are rich in nutrients. And I, I don't know if these had fermented and there was kind of an extra attraction because of the uh, nutrition that had fermented or whether there were other items that weren't available because of the freeze. And these were kind of a fallback food, but I saw a lot of squirrels and birds eating these green ash flowers that look like the right, uh, these brown ones that had been killed. And here's, see the wax wings feeding on those frozen flowers of ash. There's a fox squirrel. And you can tell from this picture how they select, they, they could go to Safeway and fill up their cart blindfolded because they use their nose. And so they would sniff on every one of those flowers for the very best one. I don't know if it was the most rotten one or what, but they, they sniff everything. And that's how they find their 10,000 buckeyes buried in the ground and acorns under the snow. And their nose is incredible. Um, so these are the three amigos. The dogs that uh, are the guardians of the entrance to Grandview Cemetery. They live in the northwest corner of that west terminus of Mountain Avenue, where it butts into Grandview Avenue. And Bert, Ella, and Macy. Um, I count this as one of my great accomplishments over the years is that I've gotten them to not bark at me. And I know their names and I talk to them and they go, oh, it's you. And then they, they go away. But they come running up first to see if I'm uh, dangerous. But I've, I've gotten to know these dogs and I like these dogs. Um, peonies are kind of a cliche in a cemetery and uh, they're pretty cool plants, and I've figured out that they have a lot more wildlife value than I first thought. And of course, ants love them because they have uh, these things called extra floral nectaries. Um, so not just the, the action parts of the real flower, but these uh, nectaries that are like glands that produce uh, nectar and um, I think the ants are feeding on them as much as they are the, the other nectar producing parts of, on the other side of this flower. Um, so the great horned owls are kind of famous at the cemetery and everybody knows where they are in section H and they've been there for 20 years nesting in this one elm tree. A particular female that's occupied that nest for the last three years uh, is inexperienced. I think had a bad first nesting and first time she nested, I think she had a, a very bad traumatic experience with her babies hatching from the eggs and then a big rainstorm flooded them underneath her while she was uh, roost, uh, on, on top of them, warming them, protecting them. And I think the elm tree crotch filled with water and I think her babies flooded underneath her and that was a bad experience. The next two years, she just jumps off the eggs when there's a snowflake, and I think the eggs have frozen. And last year was no exception, the third year in a row that that nest failed. And here I was walking around in, in the cemetery in June. Mark, one of the cemetery workers, said, hey, there's a baby owl at the base of the spruce over there in section E. And I'm like, what? The nest failed. They, they haven't been nesting. They didn't nest this year. And apparently they nested a second time. They were six weeks late, but here was this baby owl, and the baby owl was covered with flies, had a broken beak, and didn't look right. Didn't 
uh, act all ferocious when I walked up close to it. And so I called the uh, Raptor program people and uh, Carrie Laxon was nice enough to come over. She got this little owl, took them back to their facility. And then I called her later and she said that that owl did not make it. It had a broken shoulder and it had injuries beyond just what you could see. And, uh, but the sibling of this bird apparently did live. And because of that success, I think they're gonna nest again and move over to section E where we can't see the nest. And won't have 50 people doing the owl on the day that the owls come out on the limbs, the babies. And that that's probably a good thing because too many people know about the owls and it's a disruption, dis, disruption to the cemetery operation, really. Um, so the owners of those three dogs, Frank and Reagan, uh, have a nice stand of yucca, glocka, yuccas growing along their fence. And I've uh, been watching the insects that, that really uh, degrade the flowers, the beautiful lily-like flowers on that stalk. And these three insects, or, well, the leaf-footed bug and then these sap beetles over on the right have really chowdered those feathers. And then this, this is the little famous you know, yucca moth that has a relationship as a almost an obligate pollinator of yuccas. I guess they've discovered that some of these yuccas don't require the moth to be pollinated, but in most cases, the moth is doing that. So this is the famous associate of yucca of flowers, yucca moth. Um, so we had another species nest at the cemetery that I had never known to nest at the cemetery before. And this is a picture of the back end of one of them. You probably can figure out what that is, but um, this might be the first urban nesting, at least the first one I know about of, of this species. The normal places up in the foothills in Ponderosa Pine. So here's this baby. I heard chirping and begging for food in the tree, and I looked at it and I said, I don't know what that is. What is that? what is that? And it was obviously calling for a parent to find it and feed it. And here comes the parent. And I was blown away that it was a Western Canada nesting in the cemetery in a spruce, supposed to be in the foothills in Ponderosa Pine. And I think it was Ted Floyd or somebody suggested that this bird was not a tanager and might, or at least he said it might be a cowbird. And I've looked and looked online and there's probably somebody watching this that knows exactly what that is for sure, whether it's a cowbird or a tanager. But I think it's a tanager because I, I knew where that bird was and I heard it making noises that were a match for my Sibley app young tanager, but it could have been a hidden female, the female could have been in there, that area and I just didn't see it making that noise. But I think I heard this bird made it make a tanager noise. I've seen cowbirds nest in the cemetery and they don't sound like this bird did. They don't look like that bird, do they? Cowbirds have white chins, bright white chins. So anyway, Whatever that is, it's unique to have, it's either a tanager raising a cowbird in the cemetery or a tanager raising a, a tanager in the cemetery and both of them are new, but that's a grasshopper in the beak. And I wouldn't guess that grasshoppers are common food for tanagers, but it was a very cool experience to watch this even though I got into it late. I didn't know there was a nesting going on. And I think I got on it the day the baby left the nest. So hummingbird, hummingbirds nest maybe as many as 10 a year in the cemetery. And I've been really monitoring that the last few years. This year, every hummingbird nest that I knew about in
two babies mated out of a broadtail hummingbird nest. Um, Mala ducks did great. She had 10 babies. Um, so into August, uh, widow skimmer dragonfly. We did, I don't know, maybe 10 species of dragonflies in the cemetery, some from the ditch and some are long distance travelers over land to feed in the open areas of the cemetery on flying insects and then they go back to the river. Um, a lot of these things I didn't see, but these are all weird things that happened at the cemetery this year. There was a rattlesnake at the tennis courts at City Park. There was a bull elk in the middle of Grandview that I never saw a dog on it. And it was also seen over by Lucille's at the post office. So maybe it had a uh, hankering for some Cajun food, but um, there was a moose down by the Discovery Museum. Uh, uh, people thought they heard a mountain lion in the cemetery one night when their dogs were barking. And I saw a wild turkey running down Mountain Avenue between the houses. So uh, if we didn't know that the cemetery is an ecotone in between the prairie and the foothills, by looking at it, the animals are telling us it's connected to the two types of habitat. Um, but this is a kind of an assortment of things in August. Uh, a fox squirrel with an acorn, a checkered skipper, uh, Louis service berry showing scorch. They, it's so hot and dry that the tips of the leaves are starting to turn brown, which is a good sign of water shortage of scorch. Here's a rock wren migrating through the cemetery, like in these big rocks called headstones. And then it almost became something you didn't hear anymore, but the constant staging of uh, water helicopters uh, over along Overland Trail heading to those nasty fires up in the mountains. Um, here's a beautiful broad-tailed hummingbird over at Nancy, Nancy's house on Fry Avenue. And a lot of those people in the, in the neighborhood east of the cemetery have feeders and, and they get rewarded. And, in August and September with a lot of hummingbird visits. And I, I enjoy the, some of the decorations on the headstones are certainly worth looking at. Uh, September, uh, great horn, or the uh, great blue heron still hanging out. They haven't got all the fish yet. Here's a broad tailed hummingbird cleaning delicately salvia uh, pollen and nectar from its beak. It was a very dainty act, a whole lot more precise than me cutting my toenails, but um, it was pretty amazing. Their feet are, are not very good for walking, but they're good for stuff like this. Um, there's a windbreaks with ash piling up behind them. That's the view from City Park looking southwest in the middle of the day. Look like 8.30 at night. So there's a couple of people that I've learned to know in the cemetery area that lost primary homes, summer homes, a lot of my friends got evacuated, and I just want to say my heart goes out to those folks. Um, um, it, this was the first year that it ever occurred to me the fire could actually maybe come into Fort Collins from the way the wind was blowing and the way these embers traveled miles, and uh, just seemed like the end time. We're all walking around with masks and I'm like, what is going on? Uh, then on September 8th, uh, the real firefighters came, <laughs> the real firefighter came to the rescue, and that was Mother Nature with a lot of rain and snow in the mountains. And it didn't put out those big fires, it knocked them back. It knocked back that Cameron Peak fire pretty well. Didn't put it out, 
even though it was several inches of snow and it roared back, but it gave the firefighters a break and, and let them uh, surround it a little bit. But you go from 99 one day or 100 one day to really cold and wet the next day. And right at the time, these barn swallows were fledging over at City Park. And this little guy looked like he's going, what was I thinking? Why did I leave the nest that was uh, under the boardwalk? Why did I let mom and dad talk me into this? <laughs> Or my brother or my sister, and this is this sucks. <laughs> and here were the uh, barn swallows climbing on the wall there at the north end of the Sheldon Lake, trying to find midges up on the wall, and they were totally desperate for insects. And when it's cold, about the only insects uh, active, if it's not below freezing are going to be midges, and that's what they were finding. And here's a western wood peewee in the cemetery, soaking wet on the ground, hopping around eating ants in the road. And you know, this, this period is when all those bird kills that we've read about in other places, New Mexico and so on, this is when it was happening. And, and I'll never forget that map of the Western United States where the entire west half of the country was bad air. And if you're a migrant and you're a breeder in Western Canada and you're trying to migrate to Mexico, there's no way you could go around this bad air and you had to go through it. And I think a lot of those birds that were found dead probably started out stressed, probably started out partly starved, couldn't find food. And when they did the autopsies, um, they found no food in their stomach. And I think the aerial insects were just gone or not in sufficient numbers. And, and I looked at some of those particles falling out of the sky and I'm like, if I was a warbler flying, strenuously all day long with my mouth open and one of those went in my lungs, what would that do to a warbler or a king later? Can't be good. Um, so everybody knows I've been looking at these psyllids, these little creatures that look like miniature cicadas that are only three, four millimeters long that make the galls on hackberry. They make nipple galls, big bumps that look like chocolate chips, uh, or they make these blisters. There's two kinds, and the birds love them when they're coming and going from these leaves, when they're coming to the leaf to lay eggs, and when they leave in the fall after they've developed in the galls. And here's a yellow rump warbler feeding on these little blister gall adult psyllids that are emerging from those um, discolored areas on the leaf. Um, here's the, a, a leaf with the nipple galls on it. And a lot of those fell to the ground early. Uh, I've never seen that before. But they were laying on the ground. The leaf turned brown and the nipple, the galls stayed green. And there's a little creature inside of there that will emerge. And here's one on the right that's been fed on by squirrels. They just bite the tops of them off and eat the insect inside. And house finches do the same thing. Well, after that snowy, rainy period, period. Um, here was a vole that I, I never see him out in the open. And here was a vole out in the turf in the cemetery going over to these leaves that had been dropped by squirrels and hydrated by the squirrels. The squirrels bit the best galls off. But this mouse was chewing on the leftovers from those galls after a day of being stuck in the hole, wet and cold. He finally came out and was hungry. I've never seen that before, where they were eating uh, insect gall material. Townsend's warbler, which is maybe you see ten of them a year uh, in the fall at the cemetery, and I didn't see very many this year. But this is a bird that doesn't breed in Colorado; it breeds in Yellowstone and further north. But we get them in the fall. Beautiful bird. Here's a Rufus hummingbird over at the Freedman's on Tri Avenue. 
that likes their uh, epilobium cana, cana, and what we used to call Zuchneria or California fuchsia. So that's a good plant if you want to attract hummingbirds, plant those. But uh, this is a rufous hummingbird. So here's the cemetery, the old office, which looks like, I don't know why they moved that out of office. That looks like a cool office, but you know, they still sneak over there and use it when they get tired of the phone at the other place. One bird that I would say really got pushed out of the mountains by the fires in unprecedented numbers all at once was the hermit thrush. And I, again, I see one or two of them in a typical fall of visits. And I know Dave Wade, EJ Rayner, and I, you know, we saw a lot of days where there was a half dozen house benches around the cemetery. So for some reason, I took a picture of this tree in March just because it seemed like it to be leaning a little more than the rest of them. And sure enough, those gale force winds we had in October pushed that tree over. And here's the stump on October 14th. So I had a before picture of a tree that ended up falling. Beautiful Norway maple that seemed to match the sky pretty good. So the, the name on this grave is corn. And here's corn being eaten by something. So this is a nice Halloween decoration somebody put on their grave. And guess who thought it was a great, uh, oh, look, they brought us food. So 13th of October, air quality in Fort Collins, worst in the United States, tied with Phoenix, Arizona. Aren't we lucky? And this was a glow off one of the headstones <laughs> on that awful day. When the East Troublesome fire blew up and went five miles in one day, and it went from being barely on the map to in the top five in the history of Colorado in terms of acreage. Unbelievable how that fire moved in one day and what it created in terms of smoke. Well, here's some more hermit thrushes, and here's one that was eating honeysuckle, which I had never seen before. And lesser goldfinches on Nancy and Karen Wilkins. Uh, I guess these are black eyed Susans, I think. Some kind of composite, but I think it's black eyed Susan. Lesser goldfinch. And then this uh, ornamental. Indian grass, which is native not too far from Colorado and Kansas, uh, planted ornamentally. This is a cultivar uh, over at Friedman's, and the juncos love that. Ever seen a mallard duck that looks like that? I looked it up online, and this is a domestic mallard called a khaki Campbell. And it's been at City Park for a couple of years, and I didn't know what sex it was until the other day, and I saw a green-headed one jump up on top of this one, so I know this is a female. And when the snows came, I saw this hermit thrush running around, picking stuff off the top of snow, and it was this kind of fly, um, a fanned fly, and... and uh, Boris tells me that those are from carrion. And a little bit later, I did find a raccoon carcass in a tree not far away. So I think that's where these flies came from. But they were on top of the snow, and the snow of thrush was plucking them off. But um, I like the artwork on the grave. Some of it's pretty cool. So here's a swamp sparrow where that was underneath a feeder over at uh, Donna Maryland's house on Fry by the ditch. And uh, it was coming up out of the ditch and sneaking up under their feeder and getting leftovers that the house fences had spilled. 
So that was a that was a nice bird to see at the cemetery at Swamp Sparrow. So this I don't know uh, is is this blocking the screen? Do you think for the view? No. No. Okay. So this chickadee was on the side of this headstone. I went over and saw what it was getting, and there was a a moth cocoon. Not very conspicuous, but that's a lappet moth cocoon. It was empty, and I took it home and tore it apart more. And all I could find in there were cocoon or were uh, remnants of a parasitic wasp. So I think the chickadee was feeding on the parasitic, uh, parasitic wasp that had fed on probably the pupa of this particular lappet moth. That's the adult, and that's the caterpillar. Of course, what's in the cocoon was a pupa, the transitional stage between these two. And some wasp had parasitized that, and the chickadee was getting that. So this, uh, one of the chapters in the book is it's going to be about how animals use the headstones. And so they hunt the headstones for whatever they can find. And maybe it's a moth hiding in the crack, or maybe it's something like this, a cocoon. Yeah. Golden crowned kinglet, nice bird to find at the cemetery. Um, I think some of the dried flowers are as pretty as the real ones, the original ones. And here's a, a elephant man house bench. And it has pox at one of the feeders east of the cemetery. And I've never seen quite that bad a case before. But Leave it to 2020 to have that kind of stuff. There's beautiful ice in the ditch. There's an odd looking mallard over at Sheldon Lake that I, there's a picture in Sibley that shows this is a female that has male characteristics. Don't see that very often. I'd never seen it before. This is a fox squirrel that obviously is from Michigan, chewing on an Ohio Buckeye. <laughs> this is a crime where I come from. Here's the new litter. <laughs> Masks everywhere. And then one day I ran into Tim Buchanan, the former city forester, and he was measuring these trees and told me that they are now the co-champion white spruce, the biggest white spruces in Colorado. And they tied because in the system they used, they measure the height, the circumference, and the crown width, give it a point total. And if the point total is within five points, it's considered a tie. So these two trees are the co-champion white spruce, which is not a native tree to Colorado, but um, so we have the, the largest uh, tied for first, or maybe the second biggest thornless honey locust tied for first, or maybe the second biggest Ohio buckeye. And then we have these two white spruce. And uh, here are the three kinds of spruce you see at the cemetery, Colorado blue, Engelman, and then this is the cone from the white spruce. And if you look at the edge of those scales, it's straight on the white spruce, on the Engelman spruce, which has also got a small cone. They're kind of pointed and rough. And then the blue spruce cones are much bigger. So here's, and that's a major food source in the cemetery for birds. And here's a red-breasted nuthatch eating one of those seeds that are pulled out of this blue spruce cone. Um, these are all sap suckers I saw at the cemetery last year. Uh, all of these at the top and the, the lower left are yellow bellies of different ages and sexes. And then the red mate that has a red spot on the back of the neck, male, female on the right. But the cemetery is a great place for sap suckers, and last year was no exception. Um, and then the famous bird at the cemetery is this little red faced screech owl. Don't ask me where it is because I'm not going to tell you. But um, uh, it's very intermittent, in, intermittent in its appearance, and um, I didn't see it until June the 4th last year. 
103 visits since I'd seen it last in uh, December of 2019. But here it is on a sunny day in, in, in uh, September. Um, or no, this is the January, a pretty recent picture of this one. There's a great little bird. I've seen maybe 75 screech owls in Colorado and they're all gray except this one. And it's red. Uh, half the birds back east are red, probably. Uh, so I think you have to go about 400 miles east of Fort Collins to start seeing red ones or ex expecting to see red ones. So this is a rare deal. Um, it was the evolution of my masts. Um, none, scarf, train robber, proper. <laughs> um, so last year I saw 145 species, I think Dave and EJ and John saw three more that I didn't see. And we had two new nestings, Red Cross Bill and Western Canager, extreme weather. COVID changed everything. The staff had to work harder and different. And um, these weekenders, which are people that, that uh, have to work off their community service hours for DUI or whatever, and are available to the city for free labor from the county. Uh, the city, the cemetery didn't get to use them because of COVID and you know they, they all show up on a bus and so they couldn't do that during COVID. So they, the cemetery guys had, the people had to work much harder this year without all this free labor. And, um, and then there's just much greater use of the public spaces by everybody just getting out. But next year, what I wanna do is keep watching these hummingbird nests and the fox squirrel diet. I work out the life history of these various gall wasps. Um, there's three dogs that I still got to get to like in me, or four. Um, I think I can get two of them, and two of them I bet I never, uh, I never achieve friendship. But I want to learn what the lichens are on the headstones. And there's moss, and and these little creatures called water bears live in moss, and I want to see one of these things microscopic creature called a tardigrade and I want to see a tardigrade in the future. So I think uh, people as a birder, I've been accused of a lot of stuff over the years by people that don't understand what I'm doing. Uh, I was even accused of cattle mutilation once by a guy out on the Eastern Plains. And um, so when I walk in the neighborhood and these people accept me, I appreciate it. And they welcome me and they tell me what they're seeing and they ask me questions. And, and these are all the people that I've learned to meet. And uh, I really wish I could live in that neighborhood. So thank you to all those people. And this is Mark Young, the uh, crew chief at the cemetery. And he's a cool guy. And I appreciate Mark and his crew. Uh, we can be proud of those people that work there, and uh, I give a gold star to Kevin and Mark and Jared and Mark and Art, and probably a couple names I forget, and uh, Jimmy that worked over at City Park 9 for 40 plus years. Good luck in your retirement. And uh, anyway, thanks for zooming in, and I thank John and Jesse and Stan for hosting me and uh, the great dinners. and. I'm not technically savvy, so having them near to handle mishaps on the Zoom is great. So be careful out there. So I guess we'll do some questions if we have time. Great. Uh, this is John Chino again. Dave, thanks so much. And um, it was great to have the chance to uh, see you several times this week and sort out the technology stuff. Um, Wow, I, I'm, I'm blown away by the photography and, and other things. We've got a bunch of questions that I'll try to work through. Again, I encourage people to type questions into the chat window. And I think the only way I can make sure I don't overlook one is just to start at the top and work my way down. And Dave, we do have a lot of questions, so probably the best chance to get through them is to offer concise answers. Okay. <laughs> so, you're telling me to be concise? 
So uh, starting with a question from Elena, do the birds seem to be making a dent in the European elm scale infestation? Uh, I would say they do, but like most uh, wild uh, relationships, uh, food relationships, they aren't going to get rid of their food because then there wouldn't be any next go around. So they uh, maybe on purpose uh, work out an equal equilibrium with these food sources. They're never going to clean them up like, like we maybe want them to in some cases. So uh -huh. yeah, they make a dent, but there's plenty of elm scale left. Gail asks, how did you know the male crossbill was going to get pine knee? pine nuts for his mate? Uh, that's, that's pure conjecture on my part, but I mean, spruce was abundantly available and it clearly left for something else. And that type of crossbill that we had there was a type, it was, it's the type called the Ponderosa crossbill. So I assume Ponderosa was what it was going for, and all the Ponderosa was west, and it always flew west. So I don't know for sure, but I, I think it's a, it's a good swag. Um, question from Sheila. Do you ever see or did you ever see wood duck ducklings at Children Lake? No, I did not. So no uh, evidence of successful breeding from that pair? No. I mean, I think they always went north. I assume they were either going to the river at like Martinez Park or maybe nesting in a cottonwood in the neighborhood over a ditch or something like that, but not, not at City Park, no. All right. Um, uh, Carl or Carol asked, what type camera are you using? Uh, Canon with the one to 400 zoom that my good friend Janiel bought me. Thank you, Janiel. Uh, it's a, a 90D, 80D, I don't know, I forget. I think it's an 80D. I think we all thank Janiel for that, uh, for that gift. Um, <laughs> so Elena wants to know, what is the best time of day to go birding at the cemetery? Um, and what's the best time at Sheldon Lake? Uh, I would say probably eight to 10 in the morning. I, I'm not an early riser. I picked a bad hobby. I'm rarely at the cemetery when everybody thinks birders go out at the crack of dawn. I'm not there then. And most of this, my visits are <laughs> uh, 10 to three in the afternoon. But uh, when I do go early in the morning, you know, within a half an hour of sunrise, I do see things easier then. So I would say early, you know, not right at, right at sunrise, but in the first few hours of daylight is probably the best. Well, you already answered the uh, a later question, which was, uh, what time do you go? Which, as we've heard, is a different question. What's the best time to go? Uh, <laughs> well, some people don't believe it when I say, and when I put on my Eber checklist that, that I was there five and a half hours or seven hours, they don't believe it. but. Uh, and, and the, the cemetery guys would probably say that I'm there all the time, but uh, <laughs> I would say 10 to 10 to 2 is probably most of the time. <laughs> Every time I go, I'm looking for your tent because I suspect you're sleeping there. Um, uh, I'll also sprinkle in some comments that are not questions because because I know you'll appreciate them. Um, uh, Kinsey says, we, we love to see you walking around and enjoying our neighborhood. And Margo says, so many beautiful photos and close-ups. Um, what size lenses do you use? 
So, so it's a one to 400 zoom. Okay. And, okay. You know, usually I've got it cranked all the way up. But Dorothy would like to know if Fort Collins cemeteries are safe for, quote, this is her term, little old ladies to visit and bird watch by themselves. Yes. They trimmed up all the spruce trees so nobody can hide underneath them. And there's always people in there walking and running, uh, jogging, walking their dogs. There's always somebody else around. The staff is always present. And so I don't think it's a scary place at all. I, I, would, I would think you'd be fine. Bring your umbrella because the sprinklers <laughs> come on. <laughs> uh, I've got a couple more additions to your list of unusual wildlife or um, comments on those. Ed says he had a wild turkey in his backyard on Laporte Avenue uh, near Shields last summer. And Polly uh, said uh, they had a bear on June 21st. Wow. Um, Kinsey said we had a bear going in between backyards in June oh, in the, the Fry neighborhood just east of the cemetery. Yeah, I forgot that one. It was a little bear and it was jumping fences like they weren't even there. I heard that story, but I never saw it. Very cool. Um, uh, so Cinnamon says, you should have shown the black-throated gray ward where you posted on Ebert on May 15, 2020 at Grandview. Beautiful. <laughs> um, I went on too long as it was. <laughs> uh, well, Marty says, excellent as always, Dave. You are an icon not only of Grandview Cemetery, but of Colorado. Elena says, what a fantastic presentation. As always, thanks. Thanks from Anne, outstanding. Lori, fabulous as always, Dave. Thanks for your insights and humor. Chris, thank you. Gail, amazing, thank you. Melanie, very interesting and enjoyable. Polly, thank you. That's Let's see. Uh, <laughs> the praise just goes on and on and on. I'm gonna scroll down and see if there are actually some questions here. Um, I, I will send you a copy of, of the, the chat conversation, Dave, so that you can read all of these kind comments. Okay, thank um, you. And at this point, I'm not seeing any questions. I'm seeing lots more comments, which I will share with Dave. Here's a question from Liz. Have you seen crossbills this year? No. No crossbills whatsoever. Okay. Um, the floor is open for additional questions. We've got the time set aside for another 15 minutes. Um, anybody have questions for Dave? I will ask one then, Dave. Oh, no, here's one from Jay. Does anything feed on the honeydew from the M scale? Um, what I've seen, I think, is that cedar wax wings favor snow that's sitting on those blackened branches. So I think it's sort of like sugary snow, watery snow. And I see the fox squirrels eating the black sooty mold and their whole muzzle is black. So I think they like the mold itself and maybe they're not on the bark, but it looks to me like they're just kind of scraping the bark and getting that black uh, sooty mold off. But I know wax wings like it. Um, um, uh, that's probably it though. Elena asks, what do you think caused the, the witch's broom? in that one tree at the cemetery? Uh, well, there's, I think the one she's talking about is uh, what pathologists would call a physiological broom. Like that's a genetic thing. It's not a organism cause. 
and that particular tree, uh, the top of that tree broke out pretty recently. So when you first come into the cemetery, there's, there's a new look to the entrance and that's half that gigantic spruce right straight ahead. When you go across the bridge, it's broken out. But that broom in there, I mean, there are brooms in nature that are caused by mistletoe, uh, you know, a parasitic plant uh, caused by mites, uh, caused by insect in, uh, infestation um, uh, and, and fungi. But, but, but that one I think that Elena is talking about is physiological or genetic. Uh, next question is from Malpavo. What tiger beetles have you seen in Grandview? Um, the only one I've seen is Punctulata, uh, the common black one. I've not seen any other ones there. It's, it's a ubiquitous, I, I've seen one land on my bed. I, I don't have very good windows in my uh, ceiling, uh, seals around my screens. And I actually had one land on my bed in my apartment. I mean, they're everywhere on sidewalks, uh, bare dirt. That's the only one I've seen. So that, that probably tells you how artificial a habitat it is in terms of the understory, is that the only one there is a starling type tiger beetle. Now, don't be dissing starlings. Uh, <laughs> so Gail asks, what should we be feeding birds if we're new to feeders and don't have lots of native plants? Um, I guess the standard answer is, black oil sunflower seeds and maybe niger thistle and maybe suet if you want to have a variety millet the cheapest bird seed not so much uh, all, yeah. all that's going to attract are juncos and um house finches um let me see, still a few more questions. What is a good evergreen tree to plant for birds? Rocky Mountain Juniper, Ponderosa Pine, Colorado Blue Spruce. Uh -huh. um, uh, Reagan asks, where will the recording link of this marvelous presentation be stored? Um, we are still sorting that out, Reagan. Um, we will uh, probably spread the word on that through our social media accounts and on our website. This is our first recording, so we don't have a standard place yet, but um, we'll be letting people know through our social media accounts and on our website. Um, and let's see. <laughs> Here's a hard one for you, Dave. The Witten family, uh, Tom Witten wants to know, when is the book coming out? <laughs> uh, 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 when the next pandemic hits and, and I can't walk and stuck inside for two, uh, two years, uh, I, I'm going to do it but I can't tell you when. Um, the logical time would, the time frame would be when I started in 2009 and 10, and then the decade that that began with ended in 2020. And one started with the white crossbill nesting and this ended with a red crossbill nesting and it would make kind of nice bookends on that decade of observation um so the decade's over and now now the pressure's on i guess but uh, there'll be a book i can't tell you when all right i don't see any more questions so it's fair game for me to ask mine um and it'll be easier than the last one or less stressful anyway um I i'm curious if you noted uh anything that was conspicuously missing from the cemetery last year? Um, anything you're used to seeing that 
um, didn't show up last year? Well, I, I think conspicuously lower numbers, anything like that? The lack of hummingbird success seemed to stand out. Um, I've been seeing brown headed cowbirds in the summer in the cemetery, and I didn't see them this year. So if that is a baby cowbird that that Western Tanager has, I never saw the parents at all. Uh, I still think it's a tanager, but uh, um, so the pigeons have disappeared that I used to be able to see on the periphery of the cemetery. And, but I think that's because they eliminated the colony over at the high school west, you know, over at Tudor High School. They got rid of the pigeons, but the pigeons used to come and be on the telephone poles off to the north, north of that shell station on uh, Laporte and Taft. And I haven't seen pigeons for years, but birds, you know, things that I could attribute to 2020 that were missing. I would say hummingbird success was one for sure. And um, uh, there was there weren't any um, wintering golden crown kinglets last year. Um, yeah. I guess right. I um, so uh, I don't see any more questions. If, if I overlooked a question, I would just ask, uh, ask that person to retype their question into the window. Um, we'll give this just one or two minutes and then I wanted to make an announcement about next month's program. Um, which I'll do. And, and, and in the meantime, if, if I missed a question, just retype it into the chat window. Um, normally, Jesse does this, but uh, I just wanted to let people know that um, at next month's program is going to be on April 15th. Again, that's Thursday, April 15th, um, 7 to 9 p.m. And our guest speaker will be Whitney Cranshaw, a colleague of Dave's at uh, from Colorado State University, who's going to be uh, revealing the secrets of a very familiar creature to, to most of us, the Miller moss and cutworms. Um, so that should be a, a fascinating program on, uh, in April, on April 15th, um, where we can all learn something about something that we frequently see and know little about. <laughs> um, I don't see any more questions, Dave. Um, I, I, I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody and just saying that was a delightful presentation. Thanks for uh, the obvious and amount of effort you put into it. Um, oh, just before we sign off, one more time, uh, what camera were you using? A Canon uh, 80D or 90D, I think. 90D with a one to 400 Canon lens, telephoto. Great. Well, um, thanks so much. Um, and, and thanks to all of you for attending. I, I believe this was our best attended um, program ever. Um, with nearly 200 people here. Um, Dave, that's a tribute to you and, um, and Jesse. Thanks for... Uh, convincing Dave to do a presentation for us. Um, I wish everybody a, a good evening. Um, I hope you're able to stay safe and maybe even enjoy the snowstorm that's coming. And of course, um, we hope to see you again in a month at our next program. Again, look to our social media accounts and our website uh, when we will um, let people know where the recording of this presentation is available. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Good night. Thank you. Too long in one place. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh. <laughs> Six and a half miles yesterday going back to 